Hi, welcome to The Shelby Show. My name is Shelby, and this week's guest is Larry London. Larry is a local musician and owner of the Great Start Music Academy in Turner. He also authored Great Start for Drum Sets, a series of instructional books and CDs. So, tell me about the books you wrote. Um, well, I had uh, been studying really hard uh, drum set, and I, it's the one thing I really wanted to figure out. And uh, so at a certain point, when I got farther into it, I uh, found a list of all the drum books that had ever been written that were still in publication, and I actually just ordered them all. I just started sending out $10 here and $15 there, and I had a couple hundred books on these charts that I was going through. And I started realizing from all these books that they're very, very similar. There's a lot of exercise books, and they really go nowhere. You could study exercises your whole life and never know how to really play a song. So um, um, I just decided that I was going to try to figure out the way I wish I was taught and try to write that. And so I went to music. I just I had a collection of music which I call Abba de Zappa and it was they were all alphabetized, so it was I just went through and wrote down all the beats as they came by in this in this in this uh, book of notation and uh, realized that there's about thirty two beats that make everything work, these grooves. And uh, then I just went, that's it. I'm gonna write the whole series around that. So I started writing the series and it really is my life's work because I have Right now there's 13 books done, and there's 30 CDs that go with it, and so you can start right at the beginning and, and just start progressing through. It's a progressive system. And then uh, there'll be two other levels to it, and so they'll end up being 30 books and 90 CDs with this thing. I, I, I plan on making it the greatest drum work of all time, so I just can't write it fast enough. I'm trying to write as fast as I can. Cool. So what do you enjoy most about your job? People. I like people a lot. You have to really like people. Somebody asked me when I moved back here from Vegas if uh, uh, what was the deal about lessons? And I go, uh, the deal about lessons? Do you want lessons or do you want to teach lessons? He goes, no, I want to, I want to teach lessons. I go, well, it's not what you have to know. It's that you have to love people. If you don't love people, you can forget <laughs> teaching because you'll be so frustrated. And, uh, but I just love people. And once you realize what people are like, um, um, you, you just kind of have to get outside of yourself for a minute and get away from your own ego and just kind of study people. And then you realize that you're really helping people. It's like you're a team. It's not like they're performing for you. It's more like you're two people trying to build the, you know, the best race car and the best race car driver possible. And you're, you're, you know, your team student trying to get them down the road as, as, as well as you can. That changes it for me. Otherwise, you know, after doing it for so long, you know, <laughs> a thousand students, you, you, you would just go screaming out of the room because it would drive you crazy, really. But once you love people, it doesn't. It doesn't. It turns it upside down. So, I mean, I think that's the key to teaching for me is yeah. just people. You know, we're all helping each other forward. Yeah, I can see that. So what's the funniest thing you remember about your job? Well, that's really, uh, man, I wish I uh, was a stamp collector. Uh, stamp collector uh, was this thing uh, in college where I read this little pop psychology book, and it talked about stamp collecting, that people collect these little, um, it's like a resume of experiences, and they roll it out to you every time they see you, and um, uh, it, you'll, you'll find people like this. And they, uh, every time you see them, it's like they're rolling out their resume of all the stuff from behind them. I tend to be the person that has like 99% of my focus forward, so it's really hard for me to go back and remember all the things, but I was sitting here trying to figure it out. And uh, there are some really funny things that's happened in, in lessons, just in lessons alone. Um, uh, I think probably the funniest thing is that I've had three people fall right off the drum stool just sitting there, not doing anything. They just, they just kind of, somehow they get their feet tied up under themselves, and they turn funny, and they just fall on the floor, just sitting there, and they're not doing anything. And uh, I've had three people do that, and uh, just thinking about that just cracks me up. I've never fallen off a drum stool, I don't know. I was playing this one uh, show where, um, uh, this is back when I was really afraid to do drum solos, and, uh, and the guy who was leading his, this uh, camp thing wanted me to do a drum solo. And uh, um, anyway, so he has the, the keyboard player play a, drum, uh, a key solo, and then he has the bass player play a solo. And then he turns to me and he goes, okay, Larry London on the drums. And right when, uh, right when uh, he said that, my throne, the, it's three legs on the throne, so it's not like a chair. There's only three. And so when one of them, one of them broke off, 
I've never even heard of this happening. Right when he said it, and I, it was on my hi-hat side, so my left foot, I had to hold myself up with my left foot, and he's sitting here going, no, go for it, go for it, just go ahead, go ahead, really. And I'm like trying to explain why I'm playing. I can't, I'm holding my, my thing in the, the seat. It was really hilarious, and I look back on that, and I go, I don't know how I survived that. You know, th Those things are really funny. I just did a, uh, a TV shoot where it was a live performance, and uh, they didn't tell us that it was going to be televised. You would think that the band would tell you if you know it's going to be televised, just to make sure you're wearing something nice and, and you're prepared. Well, they didn't, and uh, there was uh, it was all televised, and I could see the guy. This was outdoor park, and the guy came across with the camera on my left side. And maybe, I don't know, do I have a dark cloud over me or something? Because as soon as the camera came by, I look over at it, and my bass um, pedal broke the spring on it. It's not, once again, never happened in all of my life, never happened. So now my bass pedal doesn't work on my right foot, so I had to move my whole r foot over on the other side. <laughs> I almost fell off the thing, trying to play, keep this play a song, just smiling away like nothing had happened. But, uh, and I, I still haven't had anybody say they noticed that on that clip. They always say, oh yeah, I saw it on TV, but I'm, I'm so glad, I'd be mortified if somebody actually said, Oh yeah, I don't know what happened. You were playing all weird there for a minute. <laughs> it's like the whole thing broke down. So yeah, there's some really, really funny things from performancing, uh, from playing that, that are that's that. I, there's probably so many I can't even remember. You know, a lot of the settings I play in are. Uh, um, uh, some people are not the most sober that they could be, and uh, and they they act pretty pretty dumb. And uh, uh, so managing those people. Uh, for their own safety, and then uh, uh, for your own entertainment is pretty fun. I, I just have to say, yeah. Uh, there's, there's a thing, that I, I have a headset when I play because I sing, and so if I see something in the audience, I just comment on it because it's funny. Mm -hmm. And so the, there was this one uh, that I, this one uh, lady that uh, she was, she had this beard in her hand, she kept dancing, bouncing off people kind of thing, and uh, so I called her, I said her Indian name was Dances with Beers, so uh, she, she was dancing around with this beer all the time. I don't know how she managed to make it, but... Uh, those things are just funny, and then it sticks, that little label. So now we have this Dances with Beers thing. Anytime there's a person who can't seem to stand up with this beer in their hands, it cracks me up. So I'm not a drinker, so uh, I don't really understand that part of it. But it's kind of funny to watch. Sometimes it's funny to watch, and sometimes it's, it's kind of sad. But, but just trying to manage that stuff is my own entertainment. It keeps me entertained when I'm sitting up there playing away, watching people. Yeah. Where do you play? Well, um, I've played... Every kind of venue and every kind of setting I can think to play, actually. So, but I moved back here about seven years ago. Uh, my for my kids, they're here, and my aging mom. And um, uh, so I play really close here, really locally. I really try to stick to Salem if it's possible, even just not even to get up to Portland. I play there sometimes, and there's people who call me for these little tours and stuff, and I just can't because if I get kind of sucked off into that world where you're actually uh, traveling around, I'll just be traveling around and I can't. I have to be here. I mean, I've always had family over music, so it's really a no-brainer for me to stay here very, very close um, and, until my kids are all out on their own and, and I can resolve this with my mom, so however that plays out. So I try to stick around here really close, and so you end up playing, every, I mean, unfortunately music is held uh, usually in over 21 places because that's where they have music a lot and that's uh, where people drink and so uh, a lot of those things are over 21. I wish that it wasn't because then I could have students come out. I just was talking to a teacher about this last night that I wish there were more places that were under 21 so that the kids could really hang out and at least watch a bunch of different people play. I host a lot of jam nights which is where I'm the host band me and a bass player and a keyboard player and a guitar player, we're the host band. We play the first set, and then after that, then uh, we invite other people to come up and play. And that, that's where the, my teacher's heart kind of comes out because, yeah. well, I'd rather be playing all the time because I'm a musician <laughs> and I'm more comfortable on the stage than I am in the audience. I don't know what to do in the audience. It's really funny. But, um, uh, but to encourage people to be able to play and encourage them when they come off the stage about what they did, you know, great. And, um, it's really important. So I try to do as many of those as possible. We're doing about uh, four or five days a week of that, and so uh, um, there's a lot of it going on. And then we all have weekend work where we, as a full-time musician, which is really hard to do here, uh, you, you end up doing, you playing every which kind of way you can play. So any kind of wedding or any kind of 
I mean, there's so many different events, you know, that they have even corporate events and uh, to have music in. And I don't think people have any idea of all the different things that you do and wh all the different places you go and see <laughs> yeah. as a musician. There's some things I just really try to avoid, like the plague. Those are like house parties because they always turn into trouble somehow. Yeah. Because at least if you're in a public place, you have some sort of guidelines about control, you know, yeah. there's some certain kind of decorum of, of behavior that you have to have, you know, some minimal amount of it uh, just to have a business, but uh, home parties are the worst. I try yeah. to really avoid it. I have to really know who it is before I'll do one. Yeah. So, what, did you know what you were going to be when you grew up, or what did you want to be, or did you know you were going to be a drummer? Well, uh, I was the only child of two parents who had businesses, and uh, um, and they were busy, and uh, they basically raised me with this idea that I could just do anything. I could just do anything I wanted to do. I, I, I can't remember them ever saying anything that was limiting, like, like, well, you couldn't do this, or you could never be a basketball player. Or, you know, I, they, they were not the people who came up with reasons not to do things. So um, as, as a result, I turned into this person who just thought I could just do whatever. I could just do, they, they just said, as long as you give your best, right? So um, my first things were, um, I loved baseball. I just loved baseball. Uh, my dad uh, was the sponsor of the Little League team, and we had the, all, the, all the baseball stuff at my house. And, and uh, uh, so I could pick out the, the number, the, the, the jersey I wanted, because I got the first pick on it. And uh, uh, we had uh, you know, a baseball field and, and, and all that stuff kind of made so that we could practice. And uh, I just loved baseball. I just think I grew up throwing things. Anything I could get in my hand, I ended up throwing. I just, every single thing, it was a pine cone or a dirt clod or a, a baseball, you know, it was anything. And uh, um, I just loved throwing things. And, um, uh, but then about ninth grade, I, it turned into something else. For some reason, it, 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 they made it really not fun oh. in school. And so I just went, you know, this isn't for me. This isn't, it needs to be more fun than that. And so I uh, backed away from that. I always said when I was a kid I wanted to be a nuclear physicist because I couldn't hardly say it. <laughs> I wanted to be a nuclear physicist. And uh, uh, I, I wish I had a recording of myself trying to say it when I was a kid. That would just be darling right now. But um, um, really, because um, my dad just was an everything guy. He did everything. You know, he was a pilot and he had companies. He was an engineer and blah, blah, blah. And he just, loved, if he was interested in something, he just did it. He just got into photography, made a photography. You know, he was that guy who, who was uh, kind of a tinkerer. And so if he was interested in refrigeration, guess what? He was taking refrigeration classes and he was figuring it out. And, uh, um, but I just wanted to do one thing really well. And so I kind of grew up with this martial arts fascination. I always said I was, was uh, Bruce Lee's illegitimate son. <laughs> and uh, for anybody who knows who Bruce Lee was. And, uh, um, I just, I just loved it. I think the idea of one guy coming in and clearing out the whole room by himself, basically, of all, the, all of his adversaries, it was just fascinating. And there was, there, was, there was no trick to it. It was just him, right? So it was very clear. I think I grew up watching Kung Fu too many times, where the guy's raised in a monastery, and, and he has to walk across the rice paper and not tear it, and, and it snag the pebble from the guy's hand. And then once he was good enough, it was like praying. He hit him with a magic wand. He had to, you know, burn the dragons into his arm, and then they sent him out into the world. And he had his his, his adventures. I I just grew up with this idea that you sit in a cave and you practice and you get good enough at something <clears throat> that you are somehow praying you're okay. You're you're signed off somehow, and you were able to go out and do your 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 work. And um, so in some ways, I still feel like I'm in the cave, and in some ways, I feel like uh, I've kind of pulled myself in from the out side uh, world in a way of touring and to bring myself back to uh, there, I've just always had family over music so that part's really important to me it's I, I just there, it's, no, it's no competition I would have stayed in Vegas if uh, um, if if it was just about music because I had everything going on there I was two different bands two different kinds of bands casino bands another band and uh, I was teaching at three different places these academies and then I I was working in a studio and uh, I, I couldn't have been happier musically um, but uh, and Salem's not a music town, mm -hmm. really. It's a state-run town, and so if you took all of the uh, musicians, uh, like in Nashville, and you replaced them with state workers, <laughs> that is Salem instead. So if you took Salem and replaced all the state workers with musicians, which is a pretty sizable chunk of Salem, right? <laughs> yeah. You took all of it out. That's what Nashville is like, and and uh, uh, it's contagious to be around. I, I'm sure that I will want to be around it again. 
Yeah. yeah. But uh, so I just try to do whatever kind of work I have here. Uh, uh, so ultimately, once I found the drums, I just that was it. You know, I took lessons in all sorts of different things and different instruments and everything. And once I got to the drums, it made sense because of my movement, you know, the whole martial arts thing where you're, everything inside of your space is, should be in your control. And that's how drumming is. If it was piano, it, that's just not enough movement for me. And I need a lot of things going on. So if I got both hands going, like I say, and if I got both feet going, and I sing when I play, I have a headset and I sing, and if I could balance a beach ball on my head, you know, I'd be happy because I just need a lot to keep my attention. I, it's... I, I'd be jumping off the stage into the crowd or something, you know, <laughs> light my amps on fire, anything to keep my attention if I, if I had to be stuck in a little, on the fretboard of a guitar. I mean, it's fascinating. Guitar's beautiful, and in my next life, I'll have big spider fingers and I'll play guitar. <laughs> but uh, um, it'll, be, it'll be, have to be another life because I haven't figured out the drums yet, and I just really want to figure that out. Yeah. So what's the craziest thing you've ever done? Why, uh, or um, the craziest thing I've ever done? Um, um, I, 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 I think if I look back on it, the craziest thing uh, I've ever done would probably be that um, I was brave enough to do something where I swim upstream instead of floating downstream. So uh, we have, um, my dad was always on this thing that they're uh, entrepreneurial thinkers. And then the, 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 who just imagine something, they just make it happen. And then there are uh, uh, employee thinkers who really need somebody else to think for them and tell them kind of what to do. And uh, there's a quote that says, you know, for every uh, composer, there's 10,000 fiddlers. And I really think that it's like that, is, is that if, if you have a compositional sort of mind where you want to create something out of nothing, it takes real craziness to do that. I think that's the craziness. I've always been a really good kid, <laughs> you know. I just I just was and uh, my parents trusted me because I was very I was okay. I, I I grew up with this thing is I would say I could say no to anything. So um if anybody anybody's trying to pressure me in any kind of yeah. goofy weirdness, I it it was a, it, it wasn't hard for me to just go, no, I'm not going to do that. That would be dumb. Yeah. You know. And uh I know a lot of people who um who are only an only child situation where they, they, they're a little more susceptible to people wanting them to do things because they're, they never had it. They weren't around it, right? Mm -hmm. they, they didn't have to fight off the manipulation of their older brother or something and trying to get them to do something. And so uh, they, they tend to have kind of a weakness towards that, I've mm -hmm. seen. Um, I don't know why, but I just didn't have that. I just was able to say no to a lot of things. So as far as crazy things in my life, uh, I can't say there was a whole lot of craziness even through college or anything. I was really that crazy. I really tried to be very safe. I don't want to be that guy who's running along the edge of the cliff and then be surprised that, whoa, I fell in. Imagine that. I can't believe I fell into this cliff. I'm not that guy to be that close to the edge of any kind of weirdness. So um, the real craziness really of my life is, is that, especially at my age now because I'm 46, is that people go, so uh, what, do you, what do you do for work? And I go, well... I'm doing it. I mean, this is what I do. I, and they go, I know, I know, I, I know you're, you're working tonight, but what do you do for a living? And I go, this is it. I, I play drums for a living. And they just can't believe it. I mean, they just go, man, I wish I would have done that. Or, I would, I, you know, I played when I was younger and I gave it up. Or there's always some, you know, life kind of reason that they kind of started floating downstream. Yeah. And um, there's a, a great quote that says, uh, the great thing about being young is you don't let the facts get in your way. Yeah. <laughs> I try to be that person all the time where I just don't, I don't let those things get in the way because you can't wait until you're 100% to do something. You just can't. You, you'll just never do it. So I'm a, I say I'm a 51% person. I get to 51% and then I just go, oh, the other 49 will work out. I just, <laughs> I just throw myself into, you know, try to work it out. Yeah. What's your biggest fear? Oh man, man, Mrs. Freud. I mean, getting serious with my biggest fears. I don't know. I, I, you don't want to talk about my favorite sport? We can talk about that. <laughs> um, 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 when you start out, you, you, I think you're more of a collection of fears than you're not, and you, uh, you, you try to uh, identify them and figure out, you know, how to deal with them. And um, there's a lot of things you're just afraid of. When, you know, when you're young, I was afraid of performing, like. Horrible. I, I just would not get on stage. And then um, once I got on stage a couple times, I realized it's not that weird. It's actually kind of fun, actually. And um, uh, so I, I'm much more comfortable on stage than I am not on stage, like I said. And it's just, it's just an easy place to be. Once you get comfortable with it, you realize 
there's no difference between the one foot off the stage and the foot up on the stage. It's just kind of fun to be there. Now, the um, I had a fear, just in, within drumming, I had a fear of playing drum solos forever. I mean, it was like a good decade of me dancing around this problem. And uh, I just got really tired of dancing around it. I was like, well, how can I have so many other things in my life that I'm really confident about? And this one thing I have avoided, I just would do anything to be, have, so I, I put somebody else on the drums. I say, here, you play me. You play something. I just shy away from it every time. And so I start doing these uh, drum contests uh, through Guitar Center they have every year. And uh, I was terrified to do it, really, <laughs> you know. But then I start um, kind of the, the, the learning part of me, start using it as a learning event. And I got away from the contest part of it. I just let go of that because you can't put music it's in a sports kind of thing. It'll never fit. And so um, I just let go of the contest part, and I just use it as a learning event. So you, you get five minutes. You can come up with anything you want. You have to play on a drum set that's not yours right after somebody else played in a room full of drummers on, and, and, and supposedly judges, and, um, and you get one shot to play it. That's it, one shot. And I just went, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put my whole self into this, and any opportunity I have, to go forward to do a solo, I'll just try to pretend that I'm someone else, and I'm, I'll pretend that I'm brave enough to do it, and I just start doing it. And then um, after a while, you start realizing that that fear was, you know, there's a thing that says, your fears are tissue paper thin, and a single courageous action will carry you through them, and um, I think that's what it was. I just hadn't even done a single courageous action. I just avoided it, like the big elephant in the room, and so I, I once you confront it, you go, is that it? I've been, that's what's been, you know, managing my life by default is this big, you know, black cloud in the room. And you just start go, looking at it and you go, that's nothing. I can't believe that owned me for so long. So probably in drumming, that was my, my biggest fear. Uh, overall, I think my biggest fear is just that I want to, I just want to earn it. I think that's what makes the, um, the drum's so fascinating for me because there's no strings attached, there's no chords, there's no machines, there's no, there's not 50 people in the drum line on, uh, like in chord drumming. It's just you, and if it's, every sound is you. If, if it's clear, if it's bad, it's you. If it's good, it's you. You have to own every part of it. It's kind of like violin. Every, every sound that comes out of it is you. And, uh, uh I just want to earn that it's good. You know, in my life, I want to look back and go, I did everything I could do. To <laughs> you know, figure figure the dumb thing out. You know, it's 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 much trickier than it looks. You know, if I could, if I if I was Bill Gates and I would uh, buy everybody in America a drum set and, and six months of lessons and oh, people with their respect for drumming would go through the roof. They if they could just sit in five minutes and try to figure it out, it would go through the roof. People have no clue. I just uh, there's a guy who comes out all the time and he sits and he's very attentive to the bands and he's he's older. He's he's probably 55 or so. He comes out and he'll sing like uh, like uh, kind of a Frank Sinatra kind of the old crooner kind of thing. And um, but he watches the band. He doesn't do anything. He's not a real drinker. He doesn't just sit there and you know just stare into his beer looking for the answer. He's he's watching the band. It's very nice. And I come off the stage and he's probably seen me play 200 times now, just since I've moved back here. And I come back and I'm talking to him, how you doing? Oh yeah, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing all right. And, uh, he goes, what do you, what's up with you? And I go, well, I'm starting this music school. Oh really? What are you, what are you going to be teaching out there? And I go, well, I teach drum set. And he goes, you can teach drum set? I go, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've been teaching drum set, you know, for almost 30 years. And, uh, really, how do you do that? And I go, well, I wrote a book series and you did? There's books for drumming? I go, yeah. Well, how do you think people do? He goes, I thought there was only like two or three different beats that you did. I go, you've been watching me play hundreds of times and you think I'm only doing two or three different beats? Man, you gotta open your eyes, buddy, because there are things going, I, I, I can't even imagine that kind of, I don't, I don't understand what people are really looking at. Drumming is incredibly, incredibly hard to do, to get really great at. Anything is hard to do, but, but it's just like that. It's just like anything, it's very, very hard to do. And, uh, like I always said about, um, if I was, uh, if I was a certain kind of academic, I would be sitting there and I would only have to manage ideas. That would be a dream for me because I have to manage ideas and act it out physically. It's two different things I have to do and it's very different to go, oh wow, you know, 20 plus 20 is 40 and then there's the answer and stamp it and move it across your desk. It's very different if you have to act out what 40 is exactly and every one becomes a different thing. I, I'm fascinated by that so I'm thankful I have my health and uh, uh, my work, and uh, I'm able to still 
you know, facilitate to make these things happen. And I, I think that's what makes drumming just endlessly interesting for me. Yeah. What's your favorite thing to do in your free time? Free time for a, a business owner? I, <laughs> I don't think there's a such thing, actually, but um, free time. Um, I, um, I, we never had days off when I was growing up, so um, uh, I didn't even know what a day off was. I didn't know what a paid day off was. Uh, I remember when I got out of college, I actually had a big argument of discussion with a, a friend of mine who was saying there was a such thing as unemployment, and I didn't believe it. I just didn't know there was a such thing. I'd never heard of it. And um, I just wasn't raised that you ever take any time off. So uh, I think this is the fascination with my kids uh, living with me now is that they just go, you just go. You just don't, you don't wait until you have like a half hour to do something. If you have two minutes, you just start doing it. And, and, and they, uh, my daughter was mentioning that. And I go, yeah, so I don't exactly know what free time is. If I had a job I didn't like, I would consider something else other than the job free time, I suppose. Kind of like you work five days and then you have a weekend, right? But I just don't have that. And I love what I do. So um, everything I do it revolves around uh, my drum school, uh, uh, the, the whole music school. I'm trying to get the, the doors on those rooms and I'll be done with the, the lesson rooms. And then the, um, uh, my own personal playing is really important. The book series is really important. I have a, uh, probably the biggest outlet for me is um, I have a, a group with my wife that's a pop music group. Her name's Mulata, her stage name. And that is, uh, that's really fun for me. I don't really consider that directly on my drumming, you know, the advancement of my drumming or my book series or the school or anything. Those are things that are really at my core. Uh, this is just really for fun, really. It's something I've wanted to do forever. So uh, we, we've got about 30-something songs, and we're just getting it out, you know, on a, on a, on a Facebook site and all that kind of thing so everybody knows. And uh, um, that's really fun for me. So I, I suppose if I had a hobby, I, I don't really have hobbies outside of music, but if I did, um, I, I suppose it would be this group that I have. I'm starting with my wife here. Our first show is in January, so I'm, I'm pretty excited. Cool. Do you have any pets? Yes. Um, well, our house got broke into like three times in a year, and if we found out it was the guy right behind us. And uh, um, anyway, when I went to the police, they go, do you, think, do you have any idea who it might be? And I go, well, honestly, just from my intuition, I think it's the guy who lives right behind us. And sure enough, um, they caught him with some stuff at a pawn shop, trying, you know, a guitar they'd ripped off. And uh, um, so he can't live there now. But as a result, uh, my wife bought a Great Dane puppy. And, uh, and which has gotten really big, actually. So, and I've never had a large dog. I've always had small dogs. I'm a real dog sort of person. And, uh, uh, but uh, never a large dog like that. And it is the biggest, clumsiest thing. It really is. It's, 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 it's Marmaduke and Scooby-Doo all over again. Um, it, it's, it's a big, clumsy dog, and it's adorable. It's adorable. I've just never been around a big dog that was so afraid. <laughs> It's afraid of every little thing. For such a big dog. Yes, and uh, it just is staggering. And uh, but it's it's darling uh, for for a big clumsy lug that he is. Uh, she is. Yeah. Chloe, a uh, great dog. Yeah. That's cool. Well, thank you for coming, Mr. London, and thank you for joining us. Until next time, this is Shelby and Mr. London saying bye. Nice. <laughs> nice, huh?